Good morning. The session from me this morning is looking at responsibility and how the responsibility for compliance is split between the operator and the transport manager. The short version or a summary of what's to come is that of course they are both individually responsible and collectively responsible. So we're going to look in a little bit more detail about how those responsibilities are split and how they overlay. The idea is that it's informal, so if you do have a question, feel free to ask me. Do I have any transport managers here? Anyone? That's good, good place to start. So I always start with this slide just to remind people that the reason we are trying to encourage operators and transport managers to be compliant is that it has an actual impact on road safety. These are some of the stats, but we're all trying to implement policies in the business, training, and I think a lot of people, particularly when they're coming up to a hearing, they put things in place, they buy the policies from the FTA or whoever, but actually if those policies are embedded in the business and you do have a regular training programme and you're monitoring where there are shortcomings and trying to plug those gaps, then the reality is that it will actually improve compliance in the business. Um, I did a case a number of years ago now, quite a serious case. I was defending an operator and one of his vehicles had been involved in a fatality. And when the police go to the premises, the officer described finding a manual on a shelf with the health and safety banner on the spine. And when he lifted it, he had to blow the dust from it before he could creak it open and read the content. And when he was describing that to the jury, because the operator had pleaded not guilty, it was really effective in putting across the message that this is an operator that understands that health and safety is important because he's got the health and safety policies. But even so, he hasn't actually done anything about it or opened the file for what was a number of years. So actually, I think if you have the policies but don't embed them and don't implement them, that can provide an even stronger message. So one of the key things or one of the key tools that you can use to improve is through audits and measuring tools, identify gaps and then try to fill them with training and policies that you constantly repeat. I do find with operators, they say, oh, I've, I've tried that, I keep pushing the drivers. We did a training session two years ago on the very point that you're describing, but it hasn't been effective. So I think one of the things you can do is just repeat it keep going back to it and use tools in a different way to embed the same message. You can use YouTube videos that the DVSA have put out there, training manuals, face-to-face. -face. There's lots of different ways of trying to deliver the same message, which is raising the standard in the business. I've got slightly different stats um, to the DVSA, to Howard. Yours will be right because my slide is based on the 2017 to 18 stats um, because the new one hasn't been published yet. The reason I've put this up there is just to show you, you know, how many of you there are really. A, a lot of operators will say, you know, if, you, if they give me a chance, I will come back in six months time and I will be able to demonstrate that all of the promises I've made I will by then have delivered. But the reality is if they're not already in place by the time you come up to a hearing, it, it is then difficult to establish trust because that's what a lot of the O-licensing messaging is about. You need to be able to establish with the commissioner that you are either a person or a business that can be trusted to operate compliantly. And that's partly because there are so many of you and there are so many vehicles. I think Howard said it was 468,000 vehicles specified. There's just no way that your regulator, that the investigators have the resource or the money 
to look at every operator as an individual. So they want to focus their resource on the serious and serially non-compliant. I also just highlighted from the same um, annual report some of the outcomes, really just to demonstrate that the outcomes haven't changed significantly in terms of whether your license will be curtailed, revoked. But I think one area where regulation has changed outcomes is transport managers. If you look at the stats in relation to transport manager disqualifications, even in the last published annual report, that had almost doubled. So wh why is that? The Goods Vehicle Licensing Operator Act hasn't changed, so the way in which we're regulated hasn't changed for over 10 years, even if you apply the EU regs. But I think the way that we're being, or the way that transport managers are being regulated is changed. I think the pressure is on to make sure that you are actually fulfilling the statutory duty. When I started doing public inquiries, meeting operators 10 years ago, the role of the transport manager was frequently not a big role within the business. So you would often speak to managers who described going into the operation once a week, once a month. They might take the kids out for Sunday lunch. And when you tried to drill down into what they were actually doing, um, the reality was it wasn't very much. And for some operators, that picture hasn't changed significantly. And of course, the way that those people are being regulated has changed. Um, similarly, I did a hearing this year for an operator, and there were a number of operators at the hearing. They sometimes have conjoined hearings where they will have a number of operators at the same, and their case is heard at the same time. So unrelated to my case, a transport manager was called to the hearing to give evidence. And she described a situation whereby she'd met an operator in a pub. They talked about the role that she was going to fulfill. She signed the TM1 application and they agreed some terms. So how many hours, how much she was going to be paid. She said she left the pub, never hears from this guy again. So she said, I got this letter out of the blue calling me to a hearing. I've never ever seen this guy again. I assumed the application hadn't progressed. So of course she is then told by the traffic commissioner that application did progress and you have been nominated transport manager on this license for a year. And of course this operator is a non-compliant operator and so by your absence you have allowed this to happen. So what do you think happened to that transport manager? A warning? tarnished repute or disqualification. Who thinks a warning? Tarnished repute? No, she lost her repute for that and was disqualified because the message is you cannot be a transport manager in name only. If you put your name to something, you accept that you are going to fulfill the statutory duty you are going to make sure that you find out if that application has progressed and if it has, you're going to fulfill the duty or resign because otherwise there are consequences. Now you heard from Paul from Truckfile earlier talking about his view about transport managers and I know from my own discussions with him that he thinks the role has either already become or will become completely redundant with digital technology. Because if you think about the way that this role can now be delivered, you've got the smartphone reporting in when there's a defect on the vehicle. You've got all this data being uploaded almost automatically from the vehicles. What he is saying is, why do you need a transport manager? That data can be reported in, am I right, Paul? Yeah. <laughs> Directly to the operator. So why do we need all these people? Why do we need this layer of management? But my view is that transport managers still have a really important role to play in managing the data, but in managing the drivers, because 
as Mr Forrester described earlier, over 50% of the defects they find at the roadside are because drivers have not identified them. And there's nothing like some boots on the ground just going over and over those messages with the drivers. So I'm sure you all have your own views about that, as uh, I'm sure Mr Denton does. The stat doc that's prepared by the Senior Traffic Commissioner that gives you guidance as transport managers about how you should fulfil your role was updated um, last year and it really emphasised the training element of your role. I mean, I still go to inquiries in recent weeks where a transport manager will give evidence and say, I took my qualification in 1998 they're asked, when did you last do a refresher of that training? And I say, well, never, because they got their qualification and they regarded that as being sufficient. And in terms of professional competence, it is. As long as you've got the qualification, your professional competence will be retained for, for the life of your CPC. But what the... Stat doc says is we want you to refresh that training. I mean, I mean, even if you think about it from a common sense point of view, if you went to see a solicitor and they said, well, we'll happily take your case. We haven't actually done any training here for the last 20 years, but I can assure you we know what we're doing. You would be a little bit nervous, I hope, about that because you want people that are staying up to date and you want to make sure that they know what the agenda is even for traffic commissioners for your regulator, because it does change. One year, it, they might be trying to encourage you to have a roller brake test. I think that's been a theme for, for many years now. And the next year, it might be something else. So staying up to date is key, I think, for everybody. They're trying to switch transport managers from being passive, reactive, waiting for something to happen, and then trying to resolve it to being more proactive, trying to find solutions training, identify issues before they happen. That's the way the stat dog is guiding us. The basics, you should all be aware of this, I'm sure. You have to be have a good reputation, professional competence, and of course you have to meet the 4 and 50 rule as transport managers. So if you're external, you can cover four licences with a maximum of 50 vehicles. Um, that is discretionary but that's the maximum. This uh, sometimes comes as a surprise to transport managers, the genuine link point. There has to be, legally, a genuine link between the transport manager and the operator. And the transport manager has to be a natural person. And that term means you can't be a company. Uh, a limited company cannot be the transport manager for an operator. It has to be an individual that performs that role. So if you're an external TM and you enter into a contractual um, arrangement with an operator, it has to be between you as an individual and that company. The other issue that crops up from time to time is transport managers who say, I've known Joe Bloggs for 20 years, I've always looked after him, um, no money changes hands, he just takes me out for a pint from time to time. Well, there's a case in 2015 which confirmed that that is not a genuine link. And lots of TMs will say to me, well, <laughs> if I want to work for free, that's up to me, isn't it? And the answer is no, because if you think about it, again, just from a common sense point of view, if you're doing the job for nothing and you're not doing a very good job, the operator doesn't have the power to do anything about it. They can't discipline you because he's not paying you anything to do the job in the first place. They want that role, that job to be effective. So it has to be a paid job. If you don't have a contract and they're trying to work out whether there is a genuine link between the TM and the operator, they're going to look at who gives the orders around the place. So do the drivers know who you are? If the DVSA visit and go into the yard and the drivers say, never heard of him, they're going to be concerned about whether 
they genuinely have management of your operation. I've just set out a few of the general responsibilities that I've lifted again from the stat doc. Some of them won't come as a surprise. Some of them might come as a surprise. Notifying relevant changes. Um, keeping up to date, crops up again. It's your responsibility to make sure drivers are adequately trained. You're also expected to participate in a disciplinary process, if there is one. The list which actually appears in the stat doc is extensive, so familiarise yourself with that if you haven't already. And actually, when you finish reading it, you think, well, if I'm supposed to be doing all that, what is the operator doing? Well, they are responsible for making sure that you as transport manager are actually doing that, that you are actually running the business on a day-to-day -day business or running the transport side of it. They need to know enough about operator licensing and the data which is coming out of their operation to be able to assess whether you're actually doing your job. I'm going to give you a couple of cases. They're older cases now, but they are a good way of putting across how those responsibilities are split down. This was one of the first times that this was looked at closely. It was the case of Alison Jones. The operator in that case had put all his compliance in place. Then he gives the transport manager the job of coming in and just making sure that that ticks over, making sure that those policies are, are applied. And of course they weren't. And what they said in that case is, you can't just set it up and then leave it for somebody else to manage. That's not enough. You have to make sure that you're looking at the OCRS, looking at your data, having meetings with your transport manager to make sure they're actually fulfilling their statutory duty. The following year, there was another case that looked at this in a lot more detail. Um, Duke's Transport is a, a long read, but nevertheless a useful one. This was two brothers, the Dukes. Um, they had a big operation, family business. It had been running for about 30 years by the time they came to public inquiry. 47 vehicles, well over 100 trailers, and there was a major investigation after a surveillance operation. The outcome of that investigation was that they had over half a million missing kilometres over the period that they looked at. So they prosecuted 10% of their workforce drivers. It was uh, 42 drivers, 176 false records, which, which, which is significant. But the, the reason I'm showing you this case is because when they looked at how the work was done, what the vehicle inspector, as it then was, found was that the work that was being done could have been done legally. So it was the drivers who were doing the work in that way because they achieved greater pay and they also got back for the weekend. They didn't want the dreaded Friday night out that some of you will be familiar with. And so working in this way meant they got more pay and they didn't have Friday night out. They got back for the weekend. So was it the operator's responsibility to make sure that this wasn't happening? Well, what they said at PI was, there is only so much we can do. We've got a number of depots. We've got hundreds of people working for us. All of the individual transport managers are well-paid CPC holders. What, what do you want me to do? How much am I expected to do to make sure that this type of thing doesn't happen? Is it realistic to expect me to do it? And the answer, or at least the traffic commissioner's view, was that it, it was their job to make sure that this type of cultural misuse of the tachograph regulations was not happening in their organisation and that more should have been done to prevent it. And as a result, the two Duke brothers were disqualified from running or managing an operation for 10 years. The other directors were disqualified as well, as was the transport manager. 
And so they appealed. Unsuccessfully, the appeal court said they agreed with the traffic commissioner entirely. And they went back to the Alison Joan case that we've just looked at earlier. It's not enough to set it up and leave it to your transport manager to run. You've got to be constantly supervising them and making sure that they're reporting into you with what's happening on the ground so that you know what's happening in your organisation. In smaller operations that have grown, I often find myself saying, have you thought about having a separate layer, an external transport manager or someone coming into the business to fulfil that role, to separate the role of director and transport manager? Because it is useful to have another pair of eyes looking at your compliance, managing that side of the business, particularly if you're busy running and managing it and doing other things. But at caution, you still have to manage the transport manager and make sure you're seeing some real evidence. So you can use tools like OCRS to see your vehicles are passing MOT at first presentation. You can monitor the number of checks you're picking up at the roadside and you can talk to your TM about it. I was at a conference last week with the Traffic Commission for the East and he was talking about these monthly minuted meetings. If you are an operator with a license, they expect to see operator licensing on your agenda, at least from time to time. It's good evidence that as directors or managers, you are conscious of that in the business and that you're doing something to manage it. And as I said, you can consider an external consultant. Audits and things like that, people coming in to audit the business twice a year, once a year, they're going to give you a list of shortcomings, areas where you might improve. I think that puts people off because not only do they have the time preparing for the audit, but it's going to give you more work to do. But actually, the whole objective is to stay ahead of the game, isn't it? Because if you can prevent something from happening further down the line, as some of the other speakers have been saying, it, it does save you money in the longer term if you can get these things in place. So as operators, the, the expectation is the same, that you're going to continuously, effectively supervise what your transport manager is doing, that their, their statutory duty, of course, is to continuously and effectively manage your fleet, but that you are supervising <coughs> them and making sure they're well supported. I often go to PI and you end up with a transport manager over here saying, well, I tried. He wouldn't let me spend the money on the trucks. He wouldn't let me deliver the training because it was going to cost money and the operator over here and they're blaming each other. If you're a transport manager and the operator isn't listening to you, you need to think really carefully about whether that's someone you can continue to work with. Because if anything happens during your management of that operator's license, you're, if not the first, the second person they're going to want to speak to. The answer is really the starting point. It's a joint responsibility between you. You need to be working collaboratively in this effort, but you also have separate responsibilities as operator and transport manager. So a bit of a whistle-stop tour through transport manager and operator responsibilities. Anyone want to ask me anything about it? Trying to deliver a training course of what you're driving. <laughs> I haven't personally. I, exactly. I don't get involved in the training, but I can tell you, sir, you are not alone. All the operators I speak to say, we are training them, I can assure you. I am telling them day in, day out. They don't listen, but what the commissioner would say to me if I presented that an argument at public <laughs> inquiry is, can I see evidence of your disciplinary then? Because those that aren't listening ought to be the subject of a disciplinary process. If we try and train them and they refuse to accept it or not comply, yep. what else can we do? You say, okay, this is the infringement, this is the rule, do you understand this? Yes, sign it, and they do it again. 
Well, in terms of a process, the objective when you get these infringement reports is that you highlight where there are any trends and you try to retrain them. You document any training you've delivered on that infringement sheet. And if they keep doing it, then you have that conversation of, I have told you about this a number of times. Here's your file. I'm now going to move to disciplinary action. And that, that's all you can do. It has to be a process, doesn't it? As long as people understand that trying to train them is very similar to trying to nip the fog. I, I think they do. I think I think lots of people share your uh, share your problem.